Good morning. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and your moderator for the COVID-19 update for Wednesday, June 30th. We are joined today by the Minister of Health and Social Services, the Honourable Tracy Ann McPhee, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Our sign language interpretation is provided by Kevin Klein and our French language translation by André Boursier. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions. We will call you by name and you will each have two questions. Minister McPhee. Thank you very much, Pat. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with Dr. Hanley on the traditional territory of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachun Council. I want to thank everyone for tuning in today to listen to this update. Our thoughts and best wishes are with the elders and the community of Lower Post as they have ceremony and begin destruction of the residential school there, a long-awaited task. As you know, we are in the middle of a COVID-19 outbreak, what Dr. Hanley has called the first true wave of COVID-19 here in the territory. This is a very serious situation. Yesterday, we learned that another Yukoner has lost their life to COVID-19. This is incredibly sad news for all of us, and I want to send our sincere condolences to the family and to the friends of this person. We are truly sorry for your loss and our thoughts are with you. We have confirmed 10, more, 10 or more new cases of COVID-19 every day for the last week and on some days more than 20 new cases. We are witnessing widespread community transmission, which, which means we are no longer able to confirm the source of the cases. The majority of these cases are in Whitehorse but there are also cases in nearly all of our communities now. This is not where any of us wanted to be, but you don't get to choose when and where a pandemic strikes. What we have control over is how we respond as a territory to this wave. We are all affected by this wave and we need to work together to support each other to get through it. All Yukoners have a role to helping to stop the spread of this disease. Dr. Hanley will explain what we know about the current outbreak in a moment, but the key factors at this point are very clear. This outbreak is spreading rapidly amongst unvaccinated Yukoners. Unvaccinated individuals need to be extremely careful. You are at much greater risk of having severe symptoms that could send you to the hospital and sadly could lead to death. Some fully vaccinated individuals have been infected, but the number is low and they have had relatively mild symptoms. My message to unvaccinated Yukoners is that you can protect yourself from getting seriously sick and potentially needing intensive care by taking your shot. The vaccines provide the best level of protection that, we, that is currently available against COVID-19. If you are not yet vaccinated, please make an appointment. The more people that get their shot, the safer our territory will be. We have enough vaccines for everyone that wants one. I think it's important to emphasize that we have enough vaccines here in the territory for everyone that wants to get vaccinated. This includes our youth ages 12 to 17. We have done a full round of mobile vaccine clinics for youth in the communities and we are coming back to do more. I'm very pleased to share that more than 66% of our youth have received their first shot and 20% have received their second shot. Our teams will be back in the community starting next week, first in Mayo, then Pelly Crossing, Carmax, Dawson City, and Old Crow. You can get your first or your second shot at these clinics. The clinic in Whitehorse is open to everyone aged 12 and up. You can book an appointment and find more information at yukon.ca slash this is our shot. 
You can also walk into the clinic that's here in Whitehorse, but appointments are encouraged so as to not waste doses of vaccines and make sure there's individuals there who can help you. But if your only choice is to walk in, please do so. I sincerely thank all of the staff that have supported our vaccine rollout. We have organized one of the earliest and most aggressive vaccine rollouts in the country, and it is it has been truly inspiring to watch. More than 83% of eligible adults have received their first shot, and over 76% have now received both shots. And within two weeks of your last shot will be considered fully vaccinated. This is fantastic news. This current wave is serious, but I shudder to think where we would be if the majority of Yukoners were not immunized. Along with the vaccine team, I wanna thank all of our community partners and leaders that have helped with the vaccine rollout. This has truly been a Team Yukon effort throughout the pandemic to keep our territory safe and not an easy logistical situation. It's now more important than ever to continue working together as a team. The current wave is the biggest challenge that we have faced yet, and we need all Yukoners to come together to stop COVID-19 from spreading and to get our numbers down. We know that the primary way that COVID is spreading right now is through casual social gatherings. Last week, Dr. Hanley strongly recommended that you limit social gatherings to six people. This is truly in, really important and we need all community leaders to help us reinforce this message. It is simply not safe right now to gather in large groups of people. The vast majority of cases that we are seeing are linked to large unorganized gatherings and they are making it very difficult to contain transmission. Last week, Premier Silver talked about the important work involved in contact tracing. Large, unorganized, or even small unorganized social gatherings make contact tracing almost impossible because there are literally too many individuals involved. Large gatherings where people don't know, all don't all know each other, often make it impossible to track the chains of, the chains of transmission which leads ultimately to community spread. Keeping your social gatherings very small will make it easier to trace contacts and reduce the spread if you do become infected or if anyone at that gathering does. This applies also to bars and restaurants and you'll hear more about that. You must wear a mask unless you are seated at your table and do not mingle with other tables or other patrons. Dr. Hanley is also recommending that organized social gatherings be limited in size for the time being. 10 people indoors with masks on and 20 people outdoors with physical distancing. Again, this is to help with contact tracing and containment as more cases become detected. Our contact tracing teams have done phenomenal work over the past 16 months but they are driven to their limits by this current wave. With cases in nearly all of our communities, we are also seeing an immense strain on our capacity to provide the necessary support to help our communities address this wave. We have deployed teams to support expanded testing in communities along with our vaccine teams and other health and social supports. This will continue but we can no longer do it ourselves. The current wave is testing the limits of our public health care systems. Premier Silver has been in touch with the Prime Minister's office to request support from the federal government. My officials at Health and Social Service have also been in touch with our colleagues in other provinces and territories to request support to deal with our current situation. We need people to support our testing and contact tracing efforts and to provide social supports in all of our communities. We are also reaching out to our partners throughout the territory who have specialized resources that can help us provide the support that is needed. I must acknowledge and thank all of our staff and our partners that have been, prov have been providing services around the clock in response to this wave of COVID-19. 
Your work is so important. Please know that we are bringing in additional support to help you with your work and to give you a break. We are at a pivotal point in the pandemic right now, and it is essential that we all focus our efforts on containing this outbreak. Earlier this week, Dr. Hanley recommended that parents keep their children home from daycares for the next two weeks if they are able to do so. We recognize that not all parents are able to do this, but we are asking that those who can do so. This will limit the number of children in daycares, which will ensure that childcare is still available for essential and critical workers and those who uh, require it. It will also make it easier for staff to safely take care of children while we deal with the current outbreak in some facilities. Our government is working closely with childcare operators to ensure that they have the support and resources that they need to get through this. It is also extremely important that people do not go to work if they are sick. If you have symptoms, get tested. Don't go to work, don't socialize, and don't go into your community. Doing so puts your colleagues, your clients, your friends, and your entire community at risk. I want to remind everyone that our government has a paid sick leave rebate program. Employers and self-employed individuals are compensated for up to 10 days of sick leave. This applies if you have to stay home because you're sick, you're self-isolating, or you're caring for other household members due to COVID-19. This was one of the first programs that was introduced by our government almost 16 months ago, and it is still available. Even if you accessed it last year, you can reapply this year. We also have relief programs for Yukon businesses, including tourism businesses. You can find information about all of those support programs at yukon.ca. Our government is here to support Yukoners through these challenging times, and we will provide support as long as it is needed. Right now, we need to work together to support each other to address this wave. We all have a role to play in keeping our community safe, every one of us as an individual. Right now, that means getting vaccinated if you have not already and keeping your social gatherings to six or fewer people. When we all work together, we can end this wave, but we need everyone to do their part. Thank you to all of those who are listening today, and thank you to everyone who's doing their part to help us end this wave. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McPhee. Dr. Henley? Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Minister McPhee. <clears throat> Good morning. Bonjour. I want to also acknowledge the significance of this day for Lower Post and for Canada. And I also want to add to the minister's condolences for the loss of uh, yet uh, another Yukoner uh, yesterday. This is uh, a day of note, and it is also a day of note because this is our hundredth live stream event since the since these live streams began for the pandemic. And what should have been a celebration of sorts a time where we may have reflected on our past year, we now find ourselves in a very different situation and one where we are very much focused on the presence. And we continue to be challenged by many cases. More importantly, we have experienced in a short time three deaths, three intensive care admissions, Medevac South, and several hospitalizations. Our proud days enjoying zero or a few cases seem like a distant past right now. And we are challenged enough, as the minister indicated, with our present numbers to strain our public health capacity and significantly tax our acute care system. One month was all that it took for, for COVID to begin circulating within Yukon. And now 
we're in a situation where we can expect several weeks to come of this virus circulating at regular high daily numbers. We must be concerned about the effects of the virus causing more serious illness and death in unvaccinated Yukoners. Of course, our cases have continued to rise in the past week, and we can no longer declare this as one outbreak. The pattern, as the minister indicated, is we are seeing more disconnected cases and clusters of infection in different settings. And it's one that is more consistent with a COVID wave with community transmission within the territory. COVID-19 has maneuvered itself into recent gatherings, into homes, and even some workplaces. So what happens next, how rapidly we can get this under control depends partly on an ongoing robust public health response, but also depends heavily on how much our, through our remaining public health measures we can work to limit spread from one person to another. And there are choices that Yukoners can still make, either to hunker down for a while and limit contacts, or to let it go and bear the burden of widespread COVID activity for weeks or even months to come. Within this past week, we announced a number of outbreaks. The Whitehorse Emergency Shelter has confirmed several cases involving, therefore, a group of people who are otherwise mobile and marginalized. And we're working to curb further spread within this setting and within this population of Yukoners. In the shelter, we've begun offering COVID testing for both guests and staff. And we continue to work closely with social service officials, operational staff, and their many partners to ensure, and to, and to, to ensure that enhanced COVID safe protocols are in place. Screening of staff and guests, testing, and most importantly, wraparound supports for people in self-isolation are some of the current measures that we have in place. And adding to the stress of this outbreak is a number of daycares within Whitehorse that have been identified as places of exposure. Yesterday, we announced the closure of Bambino's Montessori Daycare Center as 18 positive cases had been linked to the daycare. It will remain closed, as the notice says, until July 9th, after all the necessary contact investigations have been completed and once self-isolation has concluded for staff and children. I know there's been much frustration and concern felt by the parents of little ones. And I've been in some of those conversations and our YCDC staff, as well as our, our crew and communications staff have fielded many calls and answered many questions. As a parent myself, I can sympathize that any circumstances that can affect your child's health and safety can bring sleepless nights. However, we are working as quickly with families and operators to keep everyone notified and everyone safe in situations that often evolve very rapidly before they resolve. The extent of these exposures have required high-risk contacts to self-isolate and get tested if symptoms appear. And with the number of cases that have been identified within these programs, I hope parents and caregivers will support keeping their children home from daycares unless they are essential or critical workers or the children are otherwise at risk if they don't attend daycare. We need our critical and essential workers more than ever, and we want them to carry on using the daycares with confidence. By following this request, we will reduce the numbers of children per daycare section or facility, and this will enable provision of more distance between children, as well as more flexibility for staff members who need to stay home if they get sick. Now for today, I'll use a small presentation to highlight where we currently stand um, in regard to the COVID-19 case activity. And before, um, before I continue, I want to mention that beginning today, we will release case numbers by community on yukon.ca. And this won't be updated daily, um, but because there are a number of processes that need to be in place to verify um, accuracy. But we will continue to have numbers of um, commun numbers by community updated, uh, and we're aiming for twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays. 
And again, that will be um, posted on the on the case count website on yukon.ca. So let's move on to an overview an overview of our current situation. And this is really from June 1st to uh, to the to the present. So um, are we okay for visualization? Yeah, okay. So as of the end of yesterday, and so there will be more numbers rolling into today's count by the end of today, um, the total number of cases confirmed in this outbreak um, is 260 with, 200, with three probables for a total of 263. Um, the, uh, w what, you, what you see here is um, numbers which are not to be confused with uh, confirmed case numbers, but the, the case numbers shown on the slide on the map here, which is, the, uh, which is a copy uh, from the other day of the, um, the public health agency uh, COVID activity map shows active, current active cases by a rate per 100,000. And uh, our active case rate right now is uh, 131, including uh, people who live in territory, our probable cases, and um, a couple who were, uh, or two or three who are actually out, out of territory, but were um, infected or exposed uh, in territory. Um, in terms of hospitalized uh, cases, I'll give you a little bit more detail um, in um, a little bit later. Um, we have uh, eight in hospital um, uh, as of today. Uh, our recovered numbers of cases, 129. And as mentioned, uh, three people have died, uh, all older individuals. In this um, in this current wave, in terms of I'm going to go over through a few figures which aren't um, which aren't reflected on this slide, but just just so you know for our current accounts um, in terms of proportions, our vac the, those who are unvaccinated uh, comprise 82 percent of uh, of cases. Those who are fully vaccinated, uh, 12 percent, and as the the minister referred to, 12 those those 12 percent have a very mild uh, to mild disease. We have only one person who has been hospitalized who has been fully vaccinated. That person is um, an uh, older individual with some underlying conditions and is actually doing well. So far, uh, we have 51 cases that have a screened positive for the gamma variant. This is clearly um, a wave that is being driven by the gamma variant. And in fact, all of our hospitalized cases for which we have confirmed uh, the, uh, the, the strain have been the P1. The age range is from one to 90 years old. And when I, when we, if we want to look at ages, we see on this is a graph of age groups by number of cases, and so we see that the highest number of cases is in the 10 to 19 age group, um, and then the second highest is in the 20 to 29 age group. So you see that there's some um, overlap there in in youth and young adults associated with many of those initial. Uh, parties and grad associated um, events and, and gatherings all around that uh, first week of June. And, uh, and the young individuals, uh, many of them reflect our daycare associated cases. So the, I, I expect that as we kind of move from the, the daycare, uh, we may get uh, uh, proportionately less cases of the very young, although uh, we know, especially with the variant that uh, that the kids are more likely to, to get um, infected, uh, and uh, especially within, within a household or within close contact situations, although the outcomes with young kids tend to be very good, even with, uh, even with a variant. 
the you'll see now what's quite remarkable actually is the relative number of cases that uh, very relatively very few cases in the older age groups so you see really only a few cases um, as we go from 60 plus and then uh, that uh, that reflects a, a, a few phenomena the most important reflection of that is of course that we have very high vaccine uptake rates in our older age groups the next thing is that if when uh, if you if you think back to the theme that the minister was emphasizing about how this outbreak is uh, is being accelerated by gatherings, uh, we know that the, the gatherings are principally in our younger younger age groups, our youth and young young adults. So you see that as a disproportionate hit. Um, so young adults less likely less likely to be vaccinated. So more unvaccinated even though the majority of our young adults who are eligible are now vaccinated, and that's great, but you still have these, these uh, existing pools of susceptible unvaccinated young adults. The majority um, of, um, of, um, of cases in older people being also unvaccinated, but there are some older individuals fully vaccinated again in, in these high exposure scenarios where there's lots of virus around. We are seeing some fully vaccinated individuals get, get infected. Uh, I said I would give a bit more detail on hospitalization. So since the 1st of June, 16 people have been hospitalized with COVID. And uh, currently, uh, actually nine, we have nine cases in hospital currently. And uh, that represents 3% overall of our cases since 1st of June. And uh, of the 16 uh, total hospitalizations, we have had to send three south for intensive care. And uh, all three of those unvaccinated. We have, um, so we have eight current hospitalizations in uh, Whitehorse General Hospital. Some of those numbers don't exactly match up and, and, and part of that is that we're getting kind of, again, moving in information on who's admitted and who's discharged. But the current status in Whitehorse Hospital as of this morning, uh, we uh, estimated to be, uh, to be eight. Um, but, but again, there may be a little bit of fluctuation. But I think this is giving you an idea of the overall picture. Of the hospitalized cases so far, we have, uh, uh, we, we've had the, the, the majority unvaccinated. We've had the, the one that I mentioned fully vaccinated, um, an older individual with some underlying medical conditions, but very stable. Uh, we've had uh, two partially vaccinated, and then we have 13 unvaccinated. Now, if we, um, I'm just going to look to see, yeah, so, so here we have, again, uh, just, a, just a graph, a graphic representation of the proportion of transmission among those who are unvaccinated. Now, these are the, I'm going to show you a couple of modeling graphs because I think it helps to give a picture of the message that the minister and I are trying to drive home today and which, which I have talked about in the, in the last week. And this is the association between, uh, first of all, about vaccine status and secondly, about the, the relationship between transmission and, and people getting together. So this is just a, this is a model of uh, what would have happened with the current, what could have happened, I should say, because we know that models are, are, are projections and uh, they're subject to many assumptions. But I think this just gives us a kind of a scale of what might have been happening with a P1, a variant driven um, wave, if our population was unvaccinated. So you see that instead of talking about hundreds of cases, we would be talking about thousands, thousands of cases at this point. We would be talking about a wave that would likely take us at least three months uh, to get through, two and a half to three months to get through. 
Uh, so you can imagine if we are stretched right now, and if the the the, the hospital is reporting. Um, that there is difficulty uh, keeping up because ev it's important that even though the numbers might seem not that big, every every person being cared for with COVID requires a very uh, a lot of care and and a lot of safety protocols and and a lot more nursing time per patient than a normal patient. So the relative burden with COVID cases is higher, and it's it's actually not that hard to start to push a hospital into surge uh, capacity. So the. Um, the point is that if we are at this point with a, with a, a 130 or so active cases, you can imagine that if that were multiplied by 10, what the uh, what the impact would be, what the impact would be, we could instead of three patients being medevaced, we might be talking about 30 patients being medevaced um, um, instead of three deaths and acknowledging this, that three deaths for us is a, is a tremendous loss. But we might be talking about 10 times that amount by now. Now, this this gray-looking rock-like structure, um, I'm going to just walk us through. If we look at what what would happen if we continued with um, our our fairly. Um, are, are fairly liberal gathering guidelines that we um, that we that we have since late May. We uh, would, and and with a population that is 60% vaccinated. So you know, if we if we look at our vaccination rate per total population, we're now at 62%, maybe 63% fully vaccinated. So we would see a wave that gradually would work its way through. Of course, this would be with contact tracing and, and, and the work that we do to uh, identify and isolate contacts. We would see this eventually would pass. Um, it might be um, around a six week wave. Um, and again, thinking uh, that we would be seeing uh, 30 cases a day for a while. Um, and as we have had cases up into the 30s and then into the 20s and then maybe gradually dwindling. But you see that there's there's a lot of uncertainty around that. And, and if you look to that, the, the right of the gray rock, uh, that gives a projection where this might be um, 12 weeks at, signif at possibly significantly higher case numbers and take, take a longer time. So when I refer to that this could go on for months and this could be lots of cases a day for months, um, that's that's what I mean. That if we if we even with 60% total population vaccination, which we are approximately at right now, we are in a position that we could be seeing a lot of transmission for a long time. And of course, the 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 case numbers per se uh, are less important than the outcomes that we start to see with uh, w with those people who get sick, particularly. The, the older unvaccinated individuals. Now, let's put in place a six person gathering limit. You can see a difference. You can see that the, the actual, that, that wave of uncertainty, the gray wave of uncertainty gets a lot narrower. And what we could expect is that we should be able to get over this in a matter of a few weeks. Um, and we should have um, an impact that would be um, uh, pretty short. So if we were to do this, and if we have been doing this for a while, within within a week to two weeks, we should be starting to see significant dropping of, of cases. And if people have been doing the right thing, and if we move past these initial two outbreaks, we could be seeing cases dropping even sooner. So this is the good news part, is uh, it shows how much we can actually control just by our own behavior and adherence to public measures, to a temporary pause, you might say, in our path forward where we just pull in the reins. It may be as little as two weeks. It may be as much as four weeks. We pull in the reins, buckle down, and we can make a huge difference to this outbreak.
so we will get this together. I will probably say that again, and and we will get we are in this together, and we will get through this together. I think that's that's really important. That this this is not just a case of some unvaccinated individuals. It's it's a a large proportion of our population. If we consider children and youth and the unvaccinated, we're talking about 40% of our population. We're talking about families that have both vaccinated and unvaccinated within a family. We, we have communities with unvaccinated and vaccinated, and we have mixing. And therefore, we all have the ability and the responsibility to do this right now for, for the sake of all of us. So keeping contacts small for now, and of course, proceeding with vaccination as we go, is going to make an impact on this wave. So those are the pictures. And I'm going to just move on with a, with a, a few more comments on our, and on our response and what we're seeing. So we have reported new cases in uh, CarMax and Pelly Crossing recently. So to respond to those uh, cases and uh, the potential for wider, wi wider distribution of cases than, than we, um, th th in other words, maybe some unknown cases, we have sent rapid response teams to support the community health center staff there uh, temporarily, just as we had done last weekend at Ross River. So teams are in those two communities, Pelly Crossing and CarMax, uh, today and were there yesterday, and depending uh, on uh, on the the progress and what uh, what we see and how people participate, can be extended uh, as late as until fr this Friday. So rapid testing will run in CarMax today from one to five, and in Pelly from noon to five today. So we are working closely with the communities. We're addressing individual needs. We're looking at requests and the risks associated with each community and with their, the, the risks of COVID. And we look at, uh, of course, that's a conversation with the community. It's also on what we're seeing in terms of cases. Uh, we look at vaccination rates. And uh, we look at other risk factors, which might include, you know, where, where is the community, the size of the community, the distribution of, um, of elders, and put all of that information together into a conversation with community leaders. And that's, this is a, re re a real priority area for us right now, is working closely to the with the communities to limit that spread. Now, we're... Overall, seeing widespread infection, of course, as I mentioned, and that's triggering serious Ill illness in some of those who are infected. And again, as a reminder, serious illness with COVID-19 is highly correlated with age. In other words, the older you are, the more you are at risk for serious illness, particularly uh, and in fact, almost exclusively uh, when you are unvaccinated. And that serious illness is driven not just by viral damage, but is by causing that reactive storm of inflammation that attacks the lungs and, and in fact, potentially many organs of those, uh, th th those individuals who are sick. So keeping that in mind, right now the likelihood of getting this virus is as high as it has ever been in Yukon. We also often don't pay enough attention, I think, to those who get very sick and then recover. So, of course, we want to save lives as much as we can. But having someone in ICU on a ventilator for a while uh, can result in weeks, months, or even years, even lifelong, potentially, of irreparable damage. So at the moment, if you notice unexplained symptoms, you need to take those symptoms seriously. Remember again, under close transmission conditions, even vaccinated people are getting infected and that's what we're seeing. But it's those without full vaccine that I most worry about. For the health and well-being of our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues and family, we must self-isolate and get tested as soon as symptoms appear. And testing is really a cornerstone of how we stop COVID-19 in its tracks. 
So more on, on these temporary public health uh, actions and I can certainly share with you a little bit of grief that this is not the summer we were planning for. And I remember thinking a year ago that I couldn't wait for what I thought would be a normal summer or a cl close to normal summer to come in 21. So the coming weeks will continue to be challenging, but we still have much to be thankful for. We are not locked down. And with this degree of transmission, it is thanks to that high vaccination rate that we do not have to close retail stores or personal care services or medical clinics. There's much we can still do to get the most out of the short Yukon summer, including safe and respectful travel to the backcountry and taking advantage of the many tourism opportunities we still have within easy reach. And despite the current challenges and trauma we are facing, we will get through. At the same time, right now, many people are getting infected and our capacity to handle this number of cases and this much illness is sorely stretching our ability to cope. Some people are getting very sick and we have unfortunately lost some beloved elders. With each of these individuals passings, we have unexpectedly lost people who would otherwise have had years of wisdom, stories and love to pass on to us. To curb the spread, each of us has a contribution to make. By reining in our freedom for a short while, we can regain more freedom for the rest of the summer and beyond. We have the chance to buckle down for the next few weeks and get a grip on COVID. As all of our counterparts around the country have experienced at various times in the last year and a half, we do not have the capacity to handle much more for long. I think you need to know, though, that we have a whole team of heroes working in the trenches right now, and I can tell you they are tired. Between the interviews that are part of contact tracing throughout the waking hours of the day, through the operation and deployment of testing and rapid response teams around the territory, through testing hundreds every day for COVID-19 and answering countless emails and phone calls. I want to thank the staff of YCDC, of community nursing around the territory and in Whitehorse, the dedicated staff of KDFN Health Center, the staff at SeaTac, our communications staff and IT support, our MOH team, the immunization team, our First Nation partners and health departments, and not least the most dedicated public servants I know, the staff of the COVID response unit, the nerve center of our government's COVID response. And on the acute side, we have our medical providers, our nursing, our EMS, our support staff and social service workers doing the actual case diagnosis, care and support that is core to keeping people safe and well as at whether they're cases or contacts. And these people are doing everything they can to protect the well-being and health of Yukoners. But to do so, they have invested a lot emotionally, mentally and physically. Meanwhile, long-term care and home care staff are keeping people safe and cared for while COVID swirls around outside. Everyone is working full out and the vaccinators keep on vaccinating. But everyone is tired and we are overtaxed. Please consider as I reiterate these temporary recommendations that are being put in place while we add surge capacity and reinforce our public health and health response thanks to a call that has gone around the country as well as reduce the transmission burden in the community in order to protect our vulnerable populations. We need to buckle down until we can take a breath, get reinforcements into place and start to bend the curve. For the next few weeks, I'm asking you to do everything you can to reduce contacts with other people. And here's what I'm asking you to do. Social gatherings, Yukoners, I'm asking you to stick to six for any social gatherings. We have seen spread of COVID in multiple social settings. 
in order to minimize the overall risk, allowing a maximum of six people for indoor and outdoor gatherings will limit the number of contacts between people. Keeping your social contacts small will help limit the outbreak. Now, similar to social gatherings, organized gatherings increase the overall risk for spread and transmission between people. I know that many of you have events organized coming up, perhaps a ceremony, a wedding, a funeral. Be aware that COVID is now almost anywhere, everywhere. And I, want, I would like you to consider postponing any event that can be postponed. And if you cannot postpone it, please scale it down. I would like you to keep to no more than 10 people indoors with masking or 20 people outdoors with physical distancing. In bars and restaurants, we have seen cases associated with frequenting several establishments. And through recent inspections, we've reached the conclusion that later within the evening into the night, some establishments and patrons are less likely to adhere to public health measures. And I must again commend the majority of bars and restaurants that have been working so hard to do the right thing and to abide by measures wherever we are in our opening up. But if you are going to, out to eat and drink, you must be very aware of the rules in place and do not visit among tables and do not crowd the bar. And after you're finished, do not linger outside. Please go home. In the workplace, do not go to work if you have any symptoms. Please do not go to work if you are sick. Remember that, as Minister McPhee described, benefits are available. And use all those other measures in the workplace, distancing and masks in those common areas and hand washing. And hand washing. And hand washing. In the daycares, as previously requested, we, we have had a daycare outbreak. We've had cases associated with other daycares. We need some time to increase our COVID control so that the chance of other daycares getting infections introduced is kept low. If you're not an essential or critical worker, if you can keep your kids at home, then please do so for now. This will keep our daycares less populated and reduce the chances of COVID transmission to others should there be infection. <clears throat> in terms of travel around and between and in communities, I said that we still want to be able to get out to the back country, and we should. But if those involved going through communities, please check in with communities. See, what they, see where they are, see what they are posting, and limit social visits between communities. Now, we're prepared to see numbers bounce around for a while, and our total numbers will definitely climb up for some weeks to come. In this Yukon's first wave, we're facing a critical time, and we need to take action. The actions we take today will help us a week from now, two weeks from now, and well beyond. By complying with the above, recommendations and advice, we can do what we need to do to limit further spread and transmission amongst our most vulnerable people. Then the next two to four weeks will determine what our path for the rest of the summer will look like. It won't be easy. It's not a lockdown. But if we do nothing, the current wave could continue, as you've seen, for weeks or possibly months. Now more than ever is a time to come together. I was thinking of the ministers asking us to come together. We have to come together and stay apart at the same time. But we need to do this as one territory and we all need to do our part. As always, please continue to follow the safe six plus one. Stick to six. Get tested if you're sick and book an appointment for your vaccine or walk in if you aren't immunized. And we'll get this, through this together, just as we have with every challenge in the last year and a half. That's it for today. Be kind. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hadley.
We'll go now to the phone lines and we'll begin with John, CKRW. Hi, uh, my question goes to Minister McPhee. Uh, recently, the third party put a call in to the Yukon government to extend the amount of available sick days by 10 additional days. I'm wondering if the Yukon government is going to heed that call. Sorry, thanks very much for your question, uh, John. Uh, I'm uh, not aware of what you are uh, asking about, and the letter has not come yet to my office, if that's where it would go. Um, and maybe it's gone to the Public Service Commission. I can indicate to you that we are uh, committed to uh, supporting Yukoners that need time off, uh, whether particularly, I guess what you're asking about is from uh, from a job with the U. Yukon territorial government uh, and uh, and supporting them in ways that they can uh, stay home from work. The priority is to be able to stay home from work if you are sick or if you're in contact with someone or if you need to care for someone uh, under the uh, COVID-19 guidance. So uh, we're certainly supportive of that. Uh, I can't answer you with respect to the specific request you're talking about, but uh, uh, certainly uh, our support continues. Uh, there are uh, other ways for individuals to use sick leave or to use special leave, those kinds of things. Uh, those are being managed on a case-by-case -case basis uh, with the directive that, uh, that we're supportive of people being able to stay home uh, so that we can end the spread uh, in uh, all social circumstances and of course uh, uh, workplaces uh, are included in that uh, situation as Dr. Hanley has mentioned. Thank you Mr. McPhee. Thank you. Do you have a second question John? Yeah my second question actually goes towards Dr. Hanley. Uh, I know that there was uh, well, the outbreak at the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter was declared and that there were some measures that were put into place. I was just wondering if we could get a little bit of light as to what exactly is being done to ensure that that spread doesn't continue. Um, I know they locked some of the doors and they're limiting access uh, to who can go in and when, but maybe a bit more specificity around that? Yeah, so those are those are some of the specifics uh, that have been done at, at facility level. And uh, the, uh, uh, you know, if, if we think of this as uh, support and uh, testing and isolation. So again, as in anywhere, it's making sure that we are finding, uh, we are continually finding cases as, as they may come up. Um, and um, um, so there is a, a testing regime and there's testing for staff, there's a testing for those who are staying um, there um, overnight and there, there's testing for people uh, coming in, guests coming in and out. So those are, and, and we, we have kind of different uh, protocols and regimes for those d d uh, different people. The, uh, and then once people um, who are identified as cases, as always, it's, it's determining who the contacts are and, and, and doing those, uh, you know, the case, com the case interviews, um, often uh, many uh, interviews uh, to determine, determine contacts and uh, any other potential settings of risk where people may also have been. So, uh, and then, and then supporting people to isolate safely. And we know that this is this can be challenging if people have chaotic lives, if they have um, if they have addictions, if uh, if if they have um, maybe temporary places to stay. Uh, we have to make sure that this is done safely and and in in, in a supportive way. Um, so uh, this requires uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of hours, and a lot of work. But but it is a, a really a vital part of the response to to um, to limiting spread. Um, and of course, there are other measures that are more sort of facility specific. So, for instance, food serving is temporarily with um, uh, food in a bag um, instead of served uh, lunches. And there are other sort of sanitary, you know, more more specific measures about sanitation in, within within the facility. Uh, but it's really uh, it, partly this is a facility response, and then partly it's a people response. So, how do we how do we ensure that people are are, um, uh, are are taken care of appropriately and at the same time 
maintained in in isolation um, so that all of those those needs are taken care of to support safe isolation. Thank you. We'll move now to Tim Whitehorse Star. Yes, good morning. Um, my first question is probably more for Dr. Hanley. I've been curious for a couple of weeks now watching this develop as to what the big difference between this spring and early summer has been as compared to last year. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, people being people, yeah. uh, we probably had grad parties and unorganized uh, social events last year. So what's the key difference between the two years? Yeah, there, I think there are two differences. One, one is uh, vaccine and one is behavior. So as I said, even though we, we talk about this uh, spreading in unvaccinated people, the, 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 the fact that the majority of the total population, the majority of young people who are vaccine eligible, um, particularly the ones uh, who are uh, 70 or over 17 plus, are in fact um, are in fact fully vaccinated, so that's that's a huge cushion. So it 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 just limits uh, the number of susceptible contacts. Um, but when you have one infected person connected to another unvaccinated person, then you're you're in very high transmission uh, risk um, scenarios, and then you go person to person to person, or one person to multiple people at a close gathering, and therefore. You, you can still have rapid, rapid spread and acceleration of spread, but vaccin vaccination has definitely limited uh, the spread. So that's one difference. The other difference is um, a year, a year of pandemic fatigue. Uh, so we, we of course have been and quite appropriately uh, progressing along a path forward, a, a reopening, a progressive, careful, phased reopening. But there's also, as we have seen everywhere in the country, if not in the world, pent up a lot of pent up fatigue, a lot of uh, pent up need to uh, that people have to gather and to celebrate, and that's that's normal after a, a year and more than a year of deprivation. Um, so much as we might admonish people uh, not to gather, we we know that at the same time there's this natural urge and push for people to uh, to gather. Um, and uh, that's, I, I think, that has, uh, the, the, the way that people gathered, I think a year ago, people were still in that early phase, in the cautious phase, and naturally less inclined, more inclined to abide by the existing measures and less inclined to kind of go, go out and have a house party or a gathering. So I think there was this feeling that it's over, we haven't seen COVID for a while, summer's coming, Time to celebrate. Lots of people, lots of countries are talking about the pandemic being close to the finish line or over. And so there's that whole kind of social phenomenon of pandemic fatigue and a need to get together, which is very, very different from a year ago. And I'll say one more thing. Uh, I said two, but the, the, act, the play of the variant is also the, the variant uh, as we've said before, th this this wave is clearly being driven uh, by by a variant, the P1 variant, and there just is no room for forgiveness. There are just there, if the circumstances are there for spread, it will spread. Thank you. Do you have another question, Tim? Yes. Uh, my next question would be. Uh, in, as far as research and so, I think most people are really appreciative that we're not in any kind of a full lockdown. But if uh, these numbers continue to mount, is there some specific criteria that you'd be looking for uh, to bring in more restrictions that people could anticipate? I think that the, uh, the minister may also want to comment, but I, I would say we, we have to be thinking of next steps um, if things don't go well, and we have to be preparing um, but but I think it's really important that we we continually try to look at where we are seeing where are we seeing issues where are we seeing transmission um, and uh, and and how do we respond connect and, and, and connect the response to the risk so so right now the focus is on is on gatherings and I do think that we will I think that uh, the message. Uh, I'm hoping the message is clear enough and the evidence is strong enough that people will respond, recognizing that if we do this for a short time, we can quickly get out of trouble. And I would re remind us, from, again, learning from the experience elsewhere, 
if we do something sooner rather than later, we don't have to do it for as long and we can get back on the road um, more quickly. So being uh, being quick to respond uh, based on what we're seeing is, is, is really important. Um, so I think we just continue to see where, where do we see issues, um, do we have signals that this is working, ha and also we have said reinforcements are on the way, uh, let's get those supports in place and, and, and see how this affects our capacity to continue. Thank you. Sure, I will uh, just make a quick comment, which I think sums up uh, my message and probably Dr. Hanley's message here today, and that is that behavioral changes by Yukoners can help make this stop. And those include not gathering in large groups, know who your contacts are, and get vaccinated. If I can say that in, in you know, as succinctly as possible, that's the message we're bringing today. Thank you. We'll move now to Claudiane, Radio Canada. Oui, Dr. Henley, en français, peut-être me, me, me refaire un peu, mais juste très, très brièvement, la gravité de la situation. Est-ce qu'il nous reste des places à l'hôpital? Combien de places? On demande l'aide d'Ottawa. De quelle aide s'agit-il? Est-ce qu'on parle de la Croix-Rouge? Est-ce qu'on parle de l'armée? Où on en est dans la gravité de la, de la, de, de la vague présentement? So, Dr. Henley, could you please repeat in French uh, how uh, important is the situation, uh, where we are in terms of room and hospital, and what needs to be done, and what kind of help will be coming to the Yukon to support us? You as well? Possibly, but not in French, oh. unfortunately. <laughs> we all. Um, question. On va peut-être expliquer dans les deux langues euh, parce que ce n'est pas précisément ce qu'on a demandé euh, antérieurement. Mais euh, on, on, a fait un, on a une liste en fait et, euh, et, et c'est une liste euh, pour euh, ce qu'on a besoin pour, pour continuer d'appuyer appuyer les gens euh, qui a besoin plus de support. Euh, que, par exemple, euh, euh, j'ai parlé du le fait que il faut il faut beaucoup de de soins pour les gens qui ont des difficultés de, de suivre les règles de, de auto isolation Donc, on a un appel pour les travailleurs sociaux. Um, C'est peut-être pas la première chose qu'on on pense que pour une réponse pandémique, mais en fait, les, 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 les appuis sociaux sont très importants pour, pour la réussite de, de l'auto-isolation. Aussi, um, les, les infirmières um, et, et pour, pour, pour aider avec la, la réponse publique, pour faire uh, la dépistage, et la, les traces euh, et les, les, les entrevues et, et, et tout, que, euh, tout, pour, tout pour aider les personnels de, de euh, euh, soins communicants et, euh, et aussi dans le, pour, les, pour les infirmières dans, le, dans les communautés et euh, pour aider euh, en, pour, le, pour les vaccins. La, la chose qu'il y a beaucoup de liens entre chaque endroit. Donc, si, si par exemple, on a quelques infirmières qui arrivent, on peut, on peut, 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 on peut, peut les mettre dans plusieurs situations euh, selon le jour et les besoins du jour. Donc, c'est aussi pour aider avec les réponses rapides pour, pour, pour l'aide dans les communautés. Uh, et uh, donc c'est uh, des exemples de, des appels qu'on a fait. Um, on a un appel pour l'assistance laboratoire et, um, et, et um, donc mais, mais il y a um, peut-être une, une liste plus spécifique qu'on peut uh, on peut partager uh, plus tard. Um, donc la gravité, de parler de la gravité de la situation, que euh, c'est c'est que on a on a on a cette éclusion, cette vague 
à un moment où les, les gens étaient peut-être déjà épuisés après un an et demi sans, sans vacances ou avec très peu de vacances, avec des, des longueurs euh, de travail. Et donc, euh, tout à coup, on a des demandes, euh, des demandes très, très lourdes sur les personnels qu'on a. Et donc, ce n'est pas juste le l'éclosion, mais c'est l'éclosion en plus de tout qu'on a, qu a été déjà, déjà fait depuis un an et demi. Donc, c'est pour, pour donner une chance pour appuyer pour, pour les, les gens dans le secteur, mais aussi pour avoir une, la, la chance de, de, de prendre un poste, de prendre une, une, une vacance, un reste pour... Uh, et donc, uh, la gravité de la situation, c'est aussi c'est réfléchi dans la, les conséquences qu'on voit avec, les, les, par exemple, les, les trois personnes qui, qui avaient besoin d'aller um, uh, uh, au, au sud pour, pour, pour les soins uh, spécialisés, les soins in intensifs, les, les trois morts et quelques autres euh, gens euh, à l'hôpital. Euh, tout ça dans, pendant un temps où on a déjà occupé avec le, le, le soin normal, tous les besoins de santé qu'on a. I'll just recapture that in English. Uh, two sides, the, 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 the question was to explain the gravity of the situation, which I think I have already explained in English, but the second was to be a little more specific on the demand that we, that we are making, or the, the, the sort of the ask, the federal ask. Um, and it's, uh, just to briefly summarize, it's for nurses, it's for social workers, um, and uh, it's uh, for a list of others to help us with um, people calling people, doing the contact tracing, assisting with nursing in the community health centers, assisting with the rapid response teams, assisting with logistics, assisting uh, with, making the, with making the calls and interviews with people. And, uh, and, and providing those social supports that I discussed previously. No. Okay. Avez-vous une autre question, Claudiane? Oh, excuse me. No, that's fine. It's fine. Une autre question, Claudiane? Minister McPhee? <laughs> if Minister McPhee wishes to add, I would be happy to hear. Well, I, I think part of your question, Claudiane, was about the hospital response and uh, certainly what uh, Dr. Hanley has, uh, has uh, focused on with respect to the public health uh, services uh, responses are incredibly important for our communities. Uh, the changes that have made, been made recently at the hospital are limited. They are uh, put in place right now for a period of two weeks and will be reassessed at that time. Um, Yukoners are being asked to only go to the emergency room if they are uh, require urgent care. Um, certainly it's available and open for for to serve you Connors. Um, there will be some new visitor restrictions at the hospital uh, with respect to um, visitors will be quite restricted uh, during this two week period um, of course uh, there are exceptions for palliative care and for uh, patients that require uh, family support and those kinds of things uh, those will be assessed at the hospital um, some uh, surgery or uh, your uh, blood tests uh, lab work, that sort of thing, uh, that are not urgent, might be delayed briefly or postponed. Um, in particular, surgery that might require someone to then be in the hospital uh, for a couple of days. If it uh, isn't urgent, that's being assessed and uh, possibly postponed. But these are the changes. Um, of course, the screening has always taken place and you arrive at the hospital, you're asked certain questions, you will continue to be asked those questions, uh, and they are, um, uh, will, as I said, re be reassessing that in a couple of weeks. Um, I can add if you have a question regarding the, uh, the requests for external or internal services and how those are expanding, but I think those have been answered by uh, Dr. Hanley. I'm happy to uh, move on. Next question, Claudiane. Oui, donc, uh, possible de me dire, Dr. Hanley, uh, en une phrase, ce que vous demandez au Yukonais de faire présentement pour uh, changer la tendance? 
So, Dr. Henley, can you summarize in one sentence what is your ask for Yukoners to make sure that we go over this period? Dans une phrase, peut-être se tiennent assis. Donc, uh, de, de, de rester, de, de, de éviter des rassemblements plus de six personnes um, pour, le, pour le moment. Ça, ça peut-être, c'est le, le, le message le plus important um, pour, pour limiter les, les, les rassemblements dans, pour, pour le moment, pour le, les prochaines semaines, peut-être deux semaines, peut-être quatre semaines, selon ce qu'on voit comme progrès. Uh, pour, pour nous permettant de mettre en place les appuis, uh, les, les appuis nécessaires pour, pour continuer. Et donc, uh, et, et pour, um, um, pour ralentir la, la, cette vague, ça peut faire une différence uh, de deux, deux, trois, quatre fois pour limiter la, la transmission et d'arrêter cette vague pour nous permettre à continuer uh, l'été. Merci. We'll move now to Chris, CBC. Hi, uh, good morning, thank you. Uh, my question, my first question is for Minister McPhee. Um, what has been the response from the feds and other jurisdictions for Yukon's request for help? And when, uh, when will people begin arriving to provide that help? Thanks, uh, Chris, for that question. The response has been extremely positive. Uh, we have uh, been, actually, the federal government's been reaching out to us. They're not unaware of what's happening here. I'm on calls uh, uh, more than once a week, quite often, with uh, federal health ministers and ministers from across the ter uh, sorry the country, including Dr. T Theresa Tam. And she is uh, has commented, of course, before about how successful the Yukon has been with respect to its vaccination. Uh, program, but it's also clearly watching uh, what is happening here now because, as uh, Dr. Hanley has described and I've described to you, there is uh, clearly a wave here in the territory that is uh, virulent, uh, that is uh, moving between unvaccinated individuals, and having that happen in a highly vaccinated uh, population is, of course, of interest uh, to them and will be of interest to our counterparts. Uh, positive response, we have um, seven nurses uh, on the way from Ontario. Uh, we have uh, made the specific request. We've had conversations over the last number of days with the federal government, um, including, as I've noted, with the Prime Minister's office. Uh, the uh, specific request for primarily personnel, uh, including, um, as uh, Dr. Hanley has said uh, en français, uh, public health workers, uh, social workers, contact tracers, people who can um, alleviate the stress uh, that's currently on our folks here. Um, I expect um, uh, will be uh, very positively responded to. Uh, the official ask went late last night uh, to uh, to the federal government. We're expecting response uh, today, um, and I would expect that uh, we're hoping everyone would start to arrive as soon as possible. But as Dr. Hanley has said, uh, his response and recommendations are looking at over the next two weeks being able to alleviate some of the stress on our public health uh, services and provide extra services for communities uh, as soon as possible, but certainly within the next few weeks. Thank you. Next question, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, next question is for Dr. Hanley. Um, I probably don't have to tell you that there's, there's a growing uh, body of research about the long-term health impacts of, of COVID-19, and you did touch on that. But I, I guess I want to ask you, what... What do you think the long-term impact of this wave of cases is going to be on Yukon's healthcare system? Yeah, that's that's a it's a really uh, interesting question because it is such a complex question at the same time. Of course, yes, I worry about the long-term impacts on individuals affected with COVID, but particularly those who 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 get sick, uh, meaning that those who require 
um, you know, high needs of oxygen or ventilation, uh, prolonged intensive care, and as, as you know, many of them do, if they are in intensive care often, that's several weeks of intensive care. So you have to worry and be concerned about the long-term effects on those individuals. I think the, uh, you know, the impact of, a, of an acute demand on a healthcare system are recovery um, after a few weeks, but then you think about, well, what, what does recovery take? And so the, the impacts, I think, are so multifold. So one of them is, who haven't we taken care of in that time, or who hasn't come to the hospital? So we, so we know that there are those consequences of unmet health needs, either because um, either because people don't come for care, and that's a, that's uh, that's been a huge uh, factor, or because uh, services have to be uh, postponed, uh, and so there are these lost opportunities for timely interventions or for screening, um, and and of course you have to catch up for that, but there is that 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 lost time which can have consequences. Um, there are the, and those are those are hard to measure. I mean, it's it's hard to measure in terms of percentages at this point. Or, but but I think these are these are areas where we need to look and study, and follow. And uh, the other uh, the other impact I think is mental health, um, and and human resources. So if you have taken such a heavy toll on people, how what what does that mean for those people's uh, careers uh, in terms of their 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 durability? Are are um, have you, are you pushing people maybe towards um, um, retirement or, or, or cutbacks that may, uh, or, or I mean cutting back on hours as a consequence of having gone through an, a hugely intense period of extraordinary demand? So I think human resource considerations are really important and I think mental health, um, both on the, uh, the service needs that we need to anticipate in terms of pandemic recovery, but also mental health of our of our providers um, who have faced burnout or near burnout conditions for a prolonged period of time. And uh, then I think is integrating, the other aspect is integrating what we've learned about um, about infection control in hospital and how how crucial it is to maintain practices of infection control that we've both reminded been reminded of and and have to um, have to maintain for for the future. So that's there are resource considerations. There's processes, rehearsals, practices, and and the impacts on on, on patient care. But uh, ultimately, for safer patient care is uh, really uh, authoritative, consistent, and impeccable infection control within our care facilities. Thank you. We'll move to Jim, Yukon News. Um, yes, I was just uh, wondering if you could tell us anything about how the small community health centers are managing the increased caseloads um, and if uh, they would be made a priority f uh, with uh, when support from outside the territory is being allocated. First? I can go. Okay. Sure. Um, thank you for that. Uh, question, Jim. Um, the community health centers are uh, being supported, as uh, Dr. Hanley spoke about uh, in, two in particular uh, today, which is uh, Pelly and Carmax, where uh, testing teams have been actually been there yesterday in um, in uh, or oh, sorry in Pelly as well. Um, so they're being supported that way. Um, we are um, increasing. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to use the word enforcement, but uh, education um, and individuals to help in the community uh, with the leadership there uh, to indicate um, to community members about the current uh, recommendations and how they should be abiding by those. Um, we expect that we should be able to um, continue um, we had an emergency response team up in Ross River last week uh, and that they were deployed there for a period of time. Uh, we're trying to stand up more of those uh, types of teams uh, so that individual communities can have the support that they want. We expect that uh, if we have increased ability uh, through uh, reaching out also 
in territory as well as to other uh, organizations uh, for that kind of support that we can put together multidisciplinary teams as the goal so that they can go to communities to support those communities. Um, there are community health nurses uh, at their, um, if they have a community nursing station and that is the central place where uh, testing and vaccination can happen and, uh, and those kinds of services as well as, uh, as Dr. Hanley has noted, uh, mental health services, some social work services. Uh, the goal is to have uh, those kind of multidisciplinary teams available for the communities that need them. Uh, we are uh, providing that service now, but I hope to uh, increase it and enhance it over the coming weeks. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe just add a couple of uh, couple of comments um, to the minister, uh, agreeing with everything the minister has pointed out quite comprehensively, but. I think there are a few things worth noting. One is how strong the community responses have been by um, by the municipalities and the First Nations. I've had many, many conversations with, with leaders and, and departments in, in the last uh, uh, few weeks. And um, the mobilization of, of those communities and, and the First Nation leadership and health departments has, um, has been um, amazing and it has really strengthened the response and that feeling of working together on, on, a, on, a, on a common problem. The second is that uh, some people may not realize the role of community nurses in, in these small communities and health centers which is uh, really a, a multiple role. I, I mean, these are, these are individuals who do um, public health. Um, you might say normal public health in terms of uh, normal um, vaccinations, uh, maternal, uh, ma ma maternal health and child, young ch children's health, and a communicable disease control in the, in the communities working with YCDC, whether that's about um, uh, you know, uh, prevention of um, of uh, infectious uh, diseases of any kind, um, let alone COVID. Um, but and they're also acute health practitioners, so they do the you know they see people with their sore throats or with their mental health crisis or with their uh, diabetes check or their blood pressure check, and they have an eye on the community. And of course, they are doing the vaccinations at the same time, and uh, they are also testing people for for COVID. So you can you can appreciate again how how they are have been uh, working full out and stretched all this time. And yes, that that definitely the surge response is to answer the needs uh, to provide some relief to the to the amazing work that the community. And nurses have been doing in in the in the small communities, and we have to mention, of course, our our small hospitals and our big small communities in Watson and Dawson Lake, which have been so such instrumental partners as uh, as as well. And uh, I think uh, the amazing leadership in community nursing that we have we have seen to organize that uh, complex uh, and and vital role of the uh, nurses in the communities. Thank you. Do you have another question, Jim? Um, yes, uh, another question uh, to do with uh, the rural communities. Um, I, I see that uh, local governments uh, have taken a, a range of actions uh, from recommending that uh, residents isolate to uh, trying to limit visitors and outsiders. I was just wondering if um, case totals or any other information you might have is reflecting if any of those measures in particular are working. It's. I think it's hard to tell from our numbers so far. It's a. It's a good question. I think that. I. I mean, clearly, uh, each community is doing something slightly different based on what they see and where they are and and, and what they see as the risks. And again, we, we have been working together through, through not just our our shop and and myself, but of course, the uh, the, the the different government departments of Aboriginal Relations and Community Services to to help support. What, what supports communities need, um, emergency social services, um, emergency coordinating center supports, logistical supports, um, communications, all of that. But, um, it, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I think it really what we want to see, and that's why I talked, I talked about 
the need right now to recognize w what communities w wish uh, based on their risk assessments and how we can support that by respecting what they wish, but also limiting that um, informal social con social travel between communities, I think is important right now. So, you know, how that translates to numbers um, is difficult, but I, I, you know, I think by and large, we, we have kept the, the numbers of infections in communities to a few. Um, and uh, I think this is being, I think we are seeing early success of, uh, of uh, communities responding, responding rapidly. And, and I think with our assistance, we will, I think, be able to maintain it to uh, a few um, by and large uh, per community. Thank you. Et finalement, Laurie, Laura Boréal. Oui, euh, en ce moment, les jeunes de, de 12 ans et moins n'ont pas besoin de faire une quarantaine. Euh, est-ce que, est que ça peut avoir, est-ce que ça pourrait changer dans les prochaines, dans les prochaines semaines? So, right now, youth less, uh, less than 12 years old do not have to self-isolate. Uh, is it possible that this, uh, this recommendation might change in the coming weeks? I think we have made recommendations based on the evidence very secure, and now we see uh, les autres, uh, les autres régions au Canada faire quelque chose uh, um, pareil. Uh, donc, la risque, en, en fait, la risque d'importation d'autres régions au, au Canada s'est diminué et s'est diminué progressivement depuis même qu'on a annoncé cette, uh, cette mesure. Donc, uh, c'est, uh, je pense, c'est. Uh, C'est important de, de suivre les règles, mais j'ai confiance que la, la règle est assez stable, qu'on peut, on peut continuer. Et maintenant, les, euh, la risque en fait euh, relative entre Yukon et, et Canada a complètement changé. Et pour maintenant, la risque en fait est, est, est plus importante ici qu'ailleurs. I, I, maybe we'll just repeat that in, in uh, English, the question around will are we contemplating changing the the um the rules around under 12 um being able to travel back without having to uh, quarantine or to self isolate if they are in the care of fully vaccinated uh, caregivers and uh i i'm just saying that it, i i see that there that that was something we made with confidence at the time a recommendation i made with confidence at the time and i would say if anything i'm more confident in that be, uh, uh measure uh in the, in the six, the the that it's a um a, a low risk measure to take because in fact the risk of importation from elsewhere in canada has dropped even more since when we introduced that that rule and the tables have turned a little bit that we are actually in a higher risk scenario in Canada than in Yukon than in the rest of Canada at this time. Have you no question, Laurie? Oui, euh, ma deuxième question c'est pour les personnes qui peuvent pas se faire vacciner avec le nombre de cas en ce moment au territoire, est-ce que Est-ce que vous recommandez aux gens qui peuvent pas avoir le vaccin de s'isoler ou, euh, ou de redoubler d'ardeur dans leur dans leur dans les mesures qu'ils prennent? Euh, voilà. There, there is a number of people who cannot be vaccinated for different reasons. Uh, do you have any specific recommendations for these people? Should they self-isolate? Should they refrain from going in public? What would be your recommendation for these people? Oui, merci pour cette question. Il y a quelques hommes, mais ils sont très peu. Il faut dire pour une chose qu'ils sont en fait très peu. Mais c'est c'est une bonne question parce que um, si on est non vacciné pour n'importe raison ou si on est vulnérable pour autre raison, peut-être si on est pleinement vacciné mais on a des conditions des conditions médicales. Qui, qui, qui peut mettre quelqu'un à un plus haut risque. Euh, Ce n'est pas une demande pour, pour, pour de l'auto-isoler, c'est plus euh, 
plus pour l'attention, pour être très con, con, conscient des risques, de faire une, une, une évaluation des risques pour chaque, euh, euh, chaque interaction, chaque, euh, euh, chaque moment où on euh, mélange avec des gens. Donc, il faut respecter ou euh, il faut rappeler toutes les mesures de, de sauf-six, de, 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 de prendre attention, de porter un masque, de laver les mains. Et toutes ces, je pense, que ça, ça, ça va être suffisant pour protéger des, des personnes à plus haut risque. Um, about people who are um, maybe more vulnerable for any, any reasons because they haven't been vaccinated or they, if those few who can't be vaccinated or perhaps people who are fully vaccinated but more vulnerable at this time because of um, um, underlying medical conditions that might make them more vulnerable to, um, to complications even while being fully vaccinated. And I think it's, it, the, the people don't have to self-isolate on these conditions if they're not otherwise contacts. It's just being careful and, and being, being very careful of what the risks are associated with any situation and to take the appropriate uh, protections that we uh, already have uh, talked about. Merci. I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. The regular COVID-19 update will take place on Wednesday, July 7th at 10.30 a.m.